And there's no doubt that the greatest gift that we could receive this morning is, uh, is not being surrounded by teenagers, although that's awesome. The greatest gift that we would have would not be to have incredible music, although it's great when we have incredible music. Uh, the greatest gift would not be a short sermon, even though Stan may disagree with that, okay? The greatest gift that we would have would be to be overwhelmed by the presence of of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ through the person of the Holy Spirit. That would be the greatest gift that we would have this morning. So certainly that's a song that we should all be able to sing together. Glad you're all here today. Um, we've uh, we, we got air conditioning. You feel the air conditioner today? All right, yes, that's good. Um, of course, some people are excited about it. Other people are freezing. You know, that's just kind of how it works. Uh, there, there, there's a guy in my last church, and he, he set his thermostat at his house at 62 degrees. That's just how it was. And there was never a day, didn't matter what year it was, uh, didn't matter how cold it was, he always wore shorts, except to church. He just felt like he had to wear pants to church, but he hated that, but he just wore shorts everywhere he went. So you know that there are some folks who, man, they just, and and here's the thing, you need to understand that we only have half of the air conditioner fixed in this building right now. Just wait till we get the other half done. That's going to be great. But you know how it works. There there are going to be some people who are going to be, you know, they'll still be sweating, and then the other people who will still need an afghan to go around them. So you just come prepared for whatever, okay? We'll just be glad to have you here in church, but glad to to, to start to have some of these things fixed. Um, uh, listen, we, uh, we, we do like to recognize our, our teenagers, we, we recognize graduates and those kinds of things this morning. Just want you to know that we, uh, we, really, we really love teenagers and, uh, and want to invest in the next generation. And one of the things that we're in the midst of is looking for a student pastor. And we have been at this for a long time. Somebody might say, well, if, if, you really, if you really love teenagers, if you really love the next generation, why don't we have someone yet? And that would be, that would be a temptation to think along those lines. But, but I want to I hopefully turn that dial to the opposite extreme. It's, it is really because we love the next generation so much that we don't have someone. If that, if that makes sense, it probably doesn't. Let me, let me just explain. We've been through this process where we, we've got a tens phase process, and we've talked about this some on Wednesday, but I just felt like this was the right opportunity, the right time to tell you what's going on. Maybe we could even get it, get it on, on Facebook so people will understand what's going on. We've been at this search for a couple of years now, and we've, been, we've, had, a, we've had a ten phase process, at least in the time that I've been here, that we have been through a couple of times already. And we have made it to the end, and things fell apart. It's that 10-phase process that I would say reveals our priority where the next generation is concerned because we don't want to just get just anybody in here. If we just wanted a warm body, we would have a warm body for you already on this stage probably helping us this morning. We would have a warm body doing different things. But that's really not what we're after. We've had, a, we've had a lot of candidates. We're probably approaching 100 resumes that we've received, maybe probably over that by now, um, throughout the last, even just the last six to eight months who have come in. And a lot of those are quality guys. There's, it's nothing against the guys that have sent their resume in to us. It's just that we have been, uh, we, we've really felt a great burden to try to find the right person, the God's man to be here to help us reach teenagers. And we just... Through, through something that maybe we have felt or maybe the person that we've talked to, something they have felt, we've just felt like it was, not, it was just not a God thing. And so we are, we're going through that process again. And, uh, and one of the reasons that I want to share that with you this morning is not just to update you, although I think it's important that we communicate those things so that you understand that we're, where we're heading and, and where we are, but also, I, I just feel that it's necessary, I feel it's important that you would pray for us in that search process. And so, we're, we're, gonna, we're, we're just going to do that right now. I, I don't, it, it may, what some people would call, interrupt the flow. I, it, it, would be a, it, it would be kind of a, kind of backwards to think that a prayer would interrupt the flow of a worship service, don't you think? And so, I, I, want, us, I want us to take a few moments right now, and I am going to ask that you would pray for our search for the next student pastor. You pray for your search committee, 
You pray for the candidate that is already there before us. You pray for that process. You pray that that candidate that God has already chosen for us, I, my prayer is, is that he's already sent, that we have his resume on file right now and that we are looking at that resume. I, I hope that's the case. It may or may not be. I hope that it is. Um, you just pray for every phase of this search and that God would bring about his will in the life of that individual and in the life of Emmanuel Baptist Church and in the life of the youth ministry and the children's ministry that we have going on here that it would be sustained until that time comes. And, uh, and I don't mean this, uh, I, I don't just throw this out as some kind of blanket prayer request. We are going to pray for that right now. Okay? Can, can we do that? What? Even if you don't want to do that, we're going to do that. Okay? So I guess if you don't want to pray, you can just sit there and just fold your hands and get a little puckered li lips or whatever and not pray. But we're, the rest of us are going to pray. Okay? We're just going to do that. And uh, give you a, check, a, a second to pray silently there where you're sitting. And then I'll close us in a time of prayer aloud. God, first of all, we do pray your presence in this room. What, what a waste of time it would be for us to have gotten dressed and looked nice, for us to practice the, the songs, for us to have studied our Sunday school lesson and brought our Bible, for us to have sung these songs and to do all that we're doing and you not be here. What a waste of time that would be. And so, Lord, we, we ask that you would bless us with your presence and even further, we ask that you would bless us with an awareness of that presence in our midst so that we'll know that we have met with you when it's all said and done. And I believe we have. I, I, I've sensed it, and, and I, I pray that others in this room have sensed it as well. And now, God, we call out to you because this is an important matter. It's an important matter in the generation that is, uh, that is growing up right now. It's an important matter in Emmanuel Baptist Church. Uh, not only in the future, which is very obvious, but also in our very present. God, we pray, um, we pray your will would be done in the lives of those teenagers who are, and children who are growing up in our church now as we speak, as well as those who will be in the coming months and years. God, there's so much that, uh, that we call out to you of, in importance in this matter, and we just ask that, you, that your will would be made obvious and that you, would, uh, that you would work your way in the processes that are in place or else change the process. We're not, we're not picky about that. We want to know what you want and reveal, reveal that how you will. And we call upon you that uh, that, that individual would, would come and, uh, and that, uh, that marriage that we would have with that leader would, uh, would be one of, uh, of a joyous occasion, but also one that would be fruitful for many, many years to come. And so work through the process and uh, make your will known to, both to us and to the candidate. And, uh, and we just look forward to seeing how this is all going to work out. And we, we look forward to, uh, to, to it making sense as to why it couldn't have worked out before now. Uh, we, just, uh, we just seek out your will and ask that that will would be done all to the, to the glory and honor of your name and to the building up of the body of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. We, uh, we celebrate with, uh, with graduates today. I want, to, uh, I want to read to you Psalm 121. I will lift up my eyes to the mountains. From where shall my help come? My help comes from the, from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to slip. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun will not smite you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will protect you from all evil. He will keep your soul. The Lord will guard your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forever. Psalm 121. We, uh, we, we see at the top of the psalm, most, most Bibles, not all Bibles, but most Bibles at the top of the psalm will have a 
subtitle. It will have just a small heading to let you know where, where this psalm stood out, what relevance it had to God's people. It says there that it is a song of ascents. A song of ascents. Now, I don't mean something that you smell, nothing that you're going to go to Yankee Candle and smell. No, ascent, when you rise up to something. Now, if you're taking notes there, you, had, uh, you got your growth guide that came in your, uh, in your bulletin. I would encourage you to take that out because that's the first blank that you are going to find there that Psalm 121, 121 is a song of ascents. It is, what you, it is what they sang when they went up. Now, the question is, is what is it that they were going up to? It was a song that God's people, that the Israelites would sing as they were making their pilgrimage to Israel, to, I mean to Jerusalem, for some type of festivity. It may have been Passover. So many people would come to Jerusalem to celebrate that thing together. They would go to the temple to celebrate that festivity together. And this, it, possibly it was sung at Passover, but some festival that would bring them together as God's people and they would travel from many, many miles away, maybe from some other place in the Promised Land in Palestine, or could have been even further away than that, that they would flood to Jerusalem. And as they were coming to Jerusalem for this festivity, for this festival, for this feast, they would be singing certain songs or certain psalms as what has been passed down to us. This was a song of ascent as we go up, as we go toward Jerusalem. We're going to sing this together. Now, it made perfect sense, and there, there are other ones too, You'll, as you read through the psalms. If you, if you read through the Psalms, you're going to find several of the Psalms that are going to have this as a heading. And this one in particular would have been very meaningful to those who were singing it. Because it, it begins by saying, I will lift up my eyes to the mountain, where shall my help come from? And where does that come from? That, does, that was not written in a vacuum. That was not written just, hey, because this sounds poetic, this sounds really nice, I think I'll write this thing down. No, it really had great meaning to them. And the meaning came because as they were coming from, from far and wide, from many different places, Jerusalem was a place that would have been up on a hill, and they would have to have gone through hills and mountains in order to get there. And going through hills and mountains back in that day was not, it was not an easy task. I mean, for us, you know, hey, guys, listen, as soon as we get finished with this, as soon as we get finished with this service, I want to meet y'all, I want to meet all men, I want y'all to come and just meet with me just right over here for just a few minutes, okay? And ladies, if you, you know, some of you ladies, you want to hang out for, over here, but it ain't for you, this is just for guys, this is a guys only little time. I want to meet with y'all because we're talking about going to the North Georgia mountains. And when we go to the North Georgia mountains, man, we're hopping in our cars, we're going to get our, on our, in our four by fours, and we're going to go to the mountains, we're going to go up some, some, uh, some uh, dirt roads that are up in the mountains, and we're going to have our four by fours, we're going to be, you know, going up there, it's not going to be any problem, just push the, push the gas pedal, put that thing in the right gear, boom, we're off, everything is fine, if you know how to drive anyway, not everybody knows how to drive. If you know how to drive, you're fine, but that wasn't how, that's not how it was back then. They would have to walk. And if you were going to walk through the mountains in ancient days, there were a lot of dangers that were awaiting you. First of all, you just had the, the sun that would beat down on you and bear down on you and sap you of all of your energy. That was one thing. There was also, there was also but because the, there was no pavement back then, there was no concrete, there was no asphalt, there was none of that stuff, Man, you're, you, there, there, was a, there was a lot of danger just in the walking, you, just the sheer slipping and falling over the rocks and, and even down the side of, 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 the, of the cliff and, and those kinds of things. Those dangers were there. Also, it was just a perfect place for robbers to hang out. The robbers would go and they would hide around a corner. They would hide behind a rock. They would be somewhere where you couldn't see them, kind of like the old westerns that you might watch when, uh, when the, the good guys were walking and then the bad guys would be up in the, up in the hills and they'd start shooting down on them or, or slinging the arrows or whatever it might have been. There were a lot of dangers from robbers who would, who would in a heartbeat, they would take you and they'd, they'd beat you, they'd take all your stuff and leave you for dead. Hence the, the story of the Good Samaritan. 
There were all kind of dangers that awaited you when you were going up into the hills or into the mountains. And so as they're getting ready to go toward Jerusalem, and they're getting set to, 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 to go to this place, and they know the dangers that are possible, they're looking up there. I'm looking up to the mountains. When I get there, where will my help come from? It was a logical question. And so the answer was also logical. I am going to turn to the Lord whom I can trust. Now this makes a lot of sense on a day like today when we are highlighting our graduates. Now we may not have our, uh, some of our graduates may not be here and, and all that. And, but the danger is, the danger is for many others of you who are not graduating, which is the majority of the people in here, to say, yeah man, go get them man. Tell them graduates. Tell them graduates where their help can come from. Can I, can I tell you that when we talk about graduates, when we think about graduates in here, whether it's, whether it's in a church service or if you're going to a graduation ceremony or, or, or what have you, it is, a, it is a great time for us to have a personal reflection even if we are not the ones graduating. Because the truth of the matter is, when we think about graduation and, and, and like the, the graduation charge that, that Royce had, and, and when we think about messages like this, we're thinking, you know, they're, they're embarking on, a, on something that is brand new in life. They're going from something that they have known, and now they're, they're getting into something that is the unknown, and they're, they're just going to a, in a whole new area that they've not experienced before. But surely we can all realize that we all fall in that category at times. We don't have to walk across a stage and get a diploma in order to understand that there are new phases of life that we come to all the time. There are, there are new jobs that we take, that we hold on to. We, we, have a, we, we, we get a new job or maybe we are moving on from our job and we're moving into retirement. Listen, that's a whole new phase of life. Or, or maybe, maybe someone has just found out that they have cancer, or they have a disease, or maybe they've had a loved one who has passed away, and all of a sudden you are graduating to a new phase of life that you have not experienced before. Sometimes those new phases of life are joyful and they're exciting, and other times they're unknown and they're very fearful, and sometimes they're even sorrowful. But we are going through a new phase of life. And it's in times like that that really Psalms like 121 can really speak to us. Because we are facing the hill. We are facing the mountain. And we don't know what awaits us in that mountain. It might not be anything. Or it might be something that is way beyond our control. And we're looking at that new phase of life. We're looking on the other side of that graduation. And we're asking ourselves, I am looking into the mountains. I don't know what's coming. Where does my help come from? Now, in light of that, many of you are graduating. Many of you are in a graduating stage. Because you've got something, that, something new that lies ahead of you, and you're not sure what that is. And it's in light of that that I want to read Psalm 121 again. And I hope that you will follow along with me. I hope you've got your Bible open. I hope, you, hope you've got your, your growth guide there ready and a pen to write just a few words down. But let's, in light of that, let's read Psalm 121 again. I will lift up my eyes to the mountains. From where shall my help come? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to slip. He, will, he who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun will not smite you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will protect you from all evil. He will keep your soul. The Lord will guard your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forever. Whatever phase you are going through, whatever phase you are looking ahead at, let me just tell you, there are, there are five hills that I would tell you to look to. And I believe that these five hills are going to represent 
everything that you need to face what you face. I believe that with all my heart. Everything that you need to face, you will face by looking to one of these hills. And so that's why I hope that you will write down just a few words there in your outline, and maybe they'll be a help to you. It, maybe right now, or maybe it's a phase that you are going to be facing very soon. Here they are. The first hill to look to would be, in importance, Mount Calvary. And these aren't really in an order, but I did put this one first because I believe it's the most important. Mount Calvary is the hill of redemption. Mount Calvary is the hill of redemption. It's where Jesus died. He died to save your soul. And I would tell you the first thing that you need to make sure of in every phase of life is, am I saved? And I would call to you today, be saved. Know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Understand that, that your salvation is not about whether or not you go to church. It's not about whether or not you're, you've turned over a new leaf. It's not whether or not you have been baptized, although all of those things are great. Your salvation comes down to one thing and one thing only, and that is what have you done with the person of Jesus Christ? Has there ever been a time in your life where you have repented of your sins and asked Jesus to come into your heart, forgive you, and to save you? If there never has, that's the first thing that needs to take place. You need to be saved today. And the first thing you need to look at, the first hill that you need to look at for your help, is, the, is, is Mount Calvary where Jesus died to secure your salvation. It is the hill of redemption. That is the first hill. Hill number two. If you are looking for help and you want to face the unknown, look to Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai is the hill of repentance. Mount Sinai is the mount, is the hill where Moses went up and he met with God and God gave him the Ten Commandments. And the Ten Commandments were never, ever meant to save you. That's why, that's why people think, well, if I, just, if I just follow the Ten Commandments, if I just follow the rules, if I'm just a, if I'm just a good person, I'll be okay. That's not what, that's not what Mount Sinai, what Sinai was about. Mount Sinai issued to us the Ten Commandments, which, which showed us God's requirements. And what we learn from God's requirements is, is that we can't do it. Mount Sinai is and always will be a reminder that we can't do it on our own. And that we must turn to God. And listen. When you enter into your new phase of life, whether it's just having graduated, whether it's moving to a new grade, new job, retirement, new phase of life, whatever it is that you are facing, you are going to find at some point in time that you will blow it. I mean, you are going to mess up royally. You are going to make some bad decisions. It just happens. And you're going to realize, you know what? I have offended God. I have gone in this direction or, or I have made this choice as a response to where I am. And this is something that is displeasing to God. And the Holy Spirit is going to come and he's going to bring conviction upon your life. And you need to understand that God has not rejected you over that. God has not just thrown you to the side. God has opened up himself and he says, come to me, repent to me, I will receive you, I will forgive you, and I will cleanse you. And there, I, I, listen, there are, there are so many people who are walking away, walking around today, and they are, they are loaded down with a burden that ultimately goes back to guilt. And, and, and people, people want to take guilt and they just want to push it down inside. They want to try to ignore it. They want to try to act like it doesn't happen. Oh, just, you just get rid Listen, not all guilt is bad. Contrary to what we've been told, i got a whole message on that. I'll talk about that later on. Not all guilt is bad. Sometimes guilt is, is a gift to us to let us know that we have offended God and God, he wants to provide for us repentance so that we can cleanse that guilt, so that we can get that guilt out of there. And there are a lot of people, the decisions that they are making today, the, the, the demeanor that they carry around with them today, the anger that is built up with inside of, with, within them, is really a result of guilt. And God says, I've got a gift for you. 
The gift is repentance. Look to Mount Sinai, the hill of repentance, where we realize we can't do it all, but God has given us a way. A third hill. A hill to look to in our new phases of life is Mount Carmel. Mount Carmel is what I would call the hill of resilience. You know what happened to Mount Carmel? One of my favorite stories in the Old Testament is the story of Elijah and the prophets of Baal. And, and, and they, they're, they're, you know, Elijah, he kind of challenges them to a contest, and it's almost a ridiculous contest. I mean, he, he says, okay, you know, guys, you got your, you got your God or your supposed God. Let's just, let's just have a little contest here. We're going we're gonna to put some stuff up on an altar, and, and whichever God sends out, sends out fire from heaven and, and consumes what is on the altar, that God wins. And they're all sitting around. They have a, they have a, they're, they're obviously good Baptists. They have a vote, and they say, yep, that's a good idea. Let's have that contest. And so they have this contest, and, and they, the Bible says it's really a funny story um, if you read it in its entirety, but the Bible says that they, they had the, he, he says, hey, you guys go first. And so they, they build their altar, and they put all the stuff on the altar, and, and, and they call to their gods, and they're dancing around, and they're calling out to them, they're crying out to them, they start cutting themselves and, and bleeding all over the place, and, and Elijah starts making fun of them. Now, we, we, we might find that in bad taste, but it's in the Bible. I kind of like Elijah. I, you know, I, sometimes I like making fun of people. I don't, there's something kind of wrong with me, I guess, but he starts making fun of them and making fun of their God. And ha ha ha, I, I I, you need to go through and read it because I don't really want to say the stuff that he said. But anyway, he starts making fun of them. And so he says, okay, all right, guys, you know, ch- just, just chill out and let, let, me, let me show you how this is done. And he makes his own altar and, he, and he, he, tries, he makes it even harder on himself. He starts pouring water on that altar. If you want something to light up, let me just tell you. Let me just, uh, guys, if, if you go on a fishing trip with us, don't bring no water and put it on the fire. It ain't going to work. But that's exactly what Elijah does. And then he calls out to his God, and he doesn't have to cut himself. He doesn't have to dance around it. He doesn't have to call out for hours. He just calls out to God. God comes. He consumes the whole thing. I mean, I mean brick and all. Takes it all. Listen. You, you will face, I don't, I don't care what phase of your life you're in, you could spend all of your time in church and the same thing would be true. You will face opposition to the way that God would have you to go. There's, there's always going to be opposition. There's always going to be someone who doesn't want you to do what God wants you to do. And in those times, you must be resilient. You must hold on to your faith. I don't care what odds are stacked against you. I don't care what vote has been taken. I don't care how many people are on the other side. When you have God on your side, you must stand firm. It is the hill of resilience. Now, this is a bonus. This is an add-on, okay? For all folks. I was about to say especially for one group. I'm not going to say that. It's really for all folks. I would also call this, and you can write this down. I'm sorry, you have to write some extra words. It's also the hill of risk. Risk. Let me tell you something. No risk, no reward. Elijah put a lot on the line here. Not, Not only his life, not only his reputation, but the reputation of his God he put on the line. And we want, to, we want to walk through life, especially as we, especially as we get, get a little bit older. We want to walk through life, and, and we want to start taking things conservative. We want to back up. We want things to be, to be safe. But sometimes there has, to be, there has to be risk if we want to move forward, if we want to accomplish something, if we want to do anything for the kingdom of God. We have to put something on the line. It is the hill of risk as well. Then... A fourth hill, if, if, if we're going to look to where our help comes from, I would say look to Mount Moriah, and that is what I would call the hill of relenting. Relenting. It's the story of Abraham and Isaac. Isaac, the, the long-awaited son of promise. He had waited decades. Decades. Now, I'm not just talking about decades in his life. He had waited like a hundred years long, Okay? But even after the promise, he had waited decades for this, for this Isaac 
to come. And then, and then God says, okay, now that you got him, now I want you to kill him. I want you to give him back to me. I want you to sacrifice your son. And I, Abraham, as far as we know, as far as we can tell, without hesitation, says, if that's what you want, that's what you get. I will surrender everything. We sing the song. We sing out of the hymnal, I surrender all. Listen, Abraham says, I really do surrender. We, we sing it in here, and how often do we leave it in here? Abraham lived that song. He says, you want him? He's yours. Listen, in, in our lives, we must be willing to surrender everything that we have to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why he's called Lord and Master, because everything that is ours is his. And I will relent. I will give it all up for him. So you, you want to know where your help comes from? It's when you surrender everything that you have to him. It is the, the hill of relenting. And then fifth and finally, the fifth, the fifth hill to look to where our help comes from is Mount Olivet. It is the hill of return. It is where Jesus will come back. Now let me tell you why this is going to matter. And, and, and for some of you, some, some of you, you, you know this better than I do, but maybe you're going through a situation in life and you just need a reminder. Others of you, you have no idea, what, you, you have no idea, you have, maybe haven't experienced this. But listen, you will come. I, I don't care how joyous this transition has been for you, how much you are looking forward, forward to the next phase of life. There will come a time where you are going to wonder why. You are going to wonder how on earth does any of this make sense? I don't get it. And normally we ask that question we, or we, we, have that, we have that sentiment when we don't like it. I don't get it because I don't like it. And we, we will ask the question of why. We'll ask the question of how. And we're, we'll, we'll ask God all kinds of questions and the, the, the thing that we have to remember, here, here's, here's there, there's, there's certain old school wisdoms that I do not like, I do not agree with, and one of, them, one of them is this. So if you go to God and ask, God will give you an answer. It'll be yes, no, or maybe. Well, I don't believe that at all. I don't believe that at all. I believe that there are some questions we will never get an answer to in this life. He'll just simply remain silent. And there are sometimes we just have to live with that. And so, so you know, if you're, if you're thinking, well, somebody's lied to you or what? Listen, sometimes we just don't know. And what we have to long for is one of the reasons that we look forward to Jesus coming back. We look forward to the consummation of the kingdom of God. Because when Jesus comes back, or when we meet him face to face... Sometimes, in a lot of ways, it's then and only then that everything in life, everything that we've experienced, everything that we've seen, every question that we've ever asked, only then will it all make sense. And there are some folks, there are some people, and I wish I was one of them, there are some people that they can, I mean, they just float through and, and they don't have to get it, you know? Yeah, I don't get it, you know, whatever. All that kind of, man, I, I, I think through this stuff, and I, I try to come up with an answer, and, and then, you know, and then of course, you know, I'm the, I'm the preacher. Somebody's going to come to me, and they're going to ask the same question I've been having, and I've, I, I'm the preacher. I've got to sound like I know what I'm talking about, right? And so I'll come up with something that sounds, you know, sounds real smart or whatever. You know, I, I, I know that's hard to believe, but sometimes I can sound smart. Doesn't mean I am, but, but I, I had to come up with some kind of an answer, and, and in the back of my mind, I'm like, I'm really not sure either. I don't get it. I've been, I've been trying to figure this out for years, and I just don't get it. And so for me, for me, it's a comforting thought to know that in the end, we will know fully, just as we have been fully known. So that, so that there are some things I remember when I was, and, and I'll use this a lot, I, and, and I'm coming to a close. I remember when I was in... Uh, when I was in college, I took a, I took a French class, and uh, that, was my, that was my foreign language, and don't ask me to say anything in French now. We, oui, that's about all I know, okay? It means yes. Um, but 
I, I, just, I remember in that class when the, the, the teacher, he would not use English in the class. And uh, he, he only spoke in, in French because it was a, a French class. I, kind of weird, right? So he wouldn't, he wouldn't use any English, but there would be some things that would not translate from English into French. There were some things that you could not explain from English into French. And there was one word that he kept using. Accepté. Accepté. Accept. Accept it. There's, there, there, there is no explanation. It just is. And, and for now, for, for the, the life that we live on this planet, sometimes that's all we've got. That's it. And you're going to come to, in this new phase of life that you are facing, there's going to come something you ain't going to get. You ain't going to like it. There's not going to be an explanation for it. There's not going to be any way around it. Accept A. Accept A. Because Jesus is coming back. And it'll all make sense then. I promise It'll all make sense then. But until then, until then, accept day. I'm facing the mountain. I'm facing that new phase, and I don't know what lies ahead. Where will my help come from? It will come from the Lord, 100% of the time. God, we thank you that we can trust you. We thank you that you have proven yourself faithful. We don't get it. We sometimes don't like it. But Lord, extend our faith. Give us a greater measure of trust in you. So that we, when we look to the hills, we know where our help comes from. God, I pray for these, uh, the graduates that we've talked about in here today. Of course, my daughter's one of them. And Lord, there's just such excitement as they look ahead, as they transition to a new phase of life. And there's still a lot of unknowns. Doesn't matter what the graduates are going to now, whether it's a new job or a promotion or further schooling or whatever it may be. Still a lot of unknown. A lot of folks who are facing a new phase in life that has nothing to do with school, has nothing to do with graduation. It's just a transition. They're not sure what lies ahead either. We thank you that no matter what our mountain is, no matter what the hill is, that we can look to you as our help, as our keeper. God, I pray your blessings and your peace upon those who are facing that transition. In Jesus' name, amen. The thing about...